my task today is really just to talk about uh, sort of globally touching a little bit on what uh, Dr. Vollmer just put up there uh, with regard to the uh, nature of our, of our group right now, but also to talk about a little bit about the interactions you'll have in our, with our group, uh, either at Anschutz or elsewhere. And so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about just the nature of the, uh, the clinical research studies that we have available right now, a little bit about what our clinic looks like, and Dr. Vollmer had up there a lot of the names of the people that many of you have met. Uh, a little bit about outcomes, and outcomes uh, are things that are, we're interested in what you tell us about how you're doing, and then also just a little brief about what's really going on around the world, what are other things that other people are interested in, Where's, where are things going over time. So uh, a little bit about the clinical studies that are presently available, um, and these are ones that have perhaps been over the course of the last couple of years, because some of these are now uh, closed or maybe open to enrollment, maybe closed to enrollment. Uh, and in different phases of development over time. But right now, uh, there are about 79 different uh, clinical research trials or studies that we're participating in. Uh, Twelve of these we've actually uh, completed within the last several months and are sort of going off the books, if you will. Uh, Fifteen, actually, uh, we never started. For one reason or another, we looked at these and we determined that they were uh, perhaps not right for us. Some of them, uh, perhaps when we looked at them, we found out that they involved uh, long usage of placebo controls, which we really don't uh, consider feasible at this point in time, especially for relapsing patients, or for any of a variety of reasons we didn't enter into. About 22 of them are in startup, and that uh, tells you that we have 22 that are in one phase or another. We're looking at uh, the contracts, the, we're looking at all the different protocols, we're trying to put them all together, get the approvals from the institutional review boards, and then at some point over the course of the next several months, they'll become available and they'll open up for enrollment. About 14 are open, but no longer enrolling. That is, the enrollment period has been completed, but we haven't uh, finished the study. We're still monitoring patients over time. They're still receiving medications or whatever it is. Uh, and then finally, about 16 are open and presently enrolling. And these are the ones that if you came to the office, we'd say we have research studies that are available, and if you're interested, we'd be happy to consider enrolling you in these trials. So a whole uh, different set of types of studies. And see, these are the types of studies that are presently available now. So 33 of these, and these include some of them are, are closed, some of them are in different phases. But 33 of these are clinical trials of one form or another. That is, a patient takes a medication and something is measured, brain MRI scans, physical examinations, blood markers, and any of a variety of other things are measured over time. And they're broken down into what we might think of as different phases. The phases of the studies are really uh, telling you where in the development of that medication uh, we have uh, progressed so far. So a phase one study is in humans. So this has left the animal models, it's left the petri dish, but we're now studying it in human beings. And typically, these are safety studies and dose-finding studies. We're not exactly sure how many uh, milligrams of a medication you might want to give to a human being. You can tell it at a mouse, but a mouse is not the same. So these are primarily safety studies and oftentimes dose adjustment studies, get an idea of what people can tolerate and how they do. Three of those are like that. We have two, uh, 10 phase two studies. Phase two studies are really still primarily focused on safety, but now you're starting to look at effectiveness as well. So oftentimes in, in our world, we'll use MRI scans as the outcome measure because as you've heard already multiple times today, the MRI scans are highly important and highly sensitive to seeing changes over time. And so uh, you can more quickly, with a relatively more uh, smaller group of patients, get an answer as to whether or not this is safe and or is there some burgeoning effectiveness that you can measure. The phase three trials, of which we have 16, these are the ones that are so-called registration trials typically. These are the ones that the pharmaceutical companies have developed uh, in conjunction with the FDA typically, uh, and they've uh, designed specific efficacy measures or effectiveness measures, and if a couple of these show positive effects and the drug remains safe, uh, then they'll go to the FDA and ask for approval of these medications. So these are the classic phase three trials, and uh, uh, many of these are the ones that will then lead to the medications that are going to be effective over time for our patients. And then finally, there are phase four studies as well. Phase four studies are post-marketing studies. These are studies that the drug is already on the market. There might be a comparison trial between two different studies, uh, two different medications. There might be ongoing safety uh, studies. Uh, there might be any of the different things looking at tolerance, looking at different types of uh, delivery devices or other things like that. So these are post-marketing and they're designed to look at different aspects of the way the medication may be used over time. In addition, we have tw uh, 12 of what 
uh, Dr. Uh, Vollmer was just speaking about, these translational studies. And these translational studies will oftentimes use uh, specific samples from patients, blood, urine, as he just mentioned, or, or any of a variety of CFCF or other things. And then we'll take those and literally go into the lab and we'll study various aspects of how those particular samples uh, are, are functioning directly taken from the patient to understand the mechanism of action of drugs, to understand the way people respond, uh, respond to the medications, or any of other a variety of different things that have to do with the connections between the drug and the human being. There are also seven just observational studies. Some of these are just where you just are interested in seeing people over time, long-term safety studies, for example. A, a medication goes on the market, say, uh, Tecfidera went on the market most recently. Uh, there's a long-term market, uh, a long-term safety study looking at how does this uh, really perfunction in the real world uh, when you look at patients for a long time. We know from the clinical trials how people have done over one to two years, but we're interested in how the real world, pe world people, when they've not been excluded because they had uh, uh, maybe a little bit of diabetes or a little bit of hypertension, they were, those patients may have been excluded from the studies, but how does this medication really perform in the real world? We have three uh, repositories. Uh, the one closest to my heart is the MS Tissue Bank, and for those of you who have signed up, I really appreciate it. This is a long-time National MS Society-funded bank. It's been in, in, uh, in use for over 30 years. We are uh, continuing to obtain samples from patients as well as uh, patients, people without MS. And researchers from out, throughout the world are asking for these samples to be available so they can do research on the human uh, samples. It's nice to work with mice, but this is a human disease, and this is the only way to do this. In addition, though, we have two other large repositories uh, looking at a variety of other kinds of samples, blood, CSF, urine, and others. And so these are very important not only for our own use, but then also for distribution around the world. And then in addition, we have three quality improvement projects. These quality improvement projects are really designed to say, what are we doing actually in the clinic with the patient? What can we do to make things uh, better? And so the first one that we, we started to look at was uh, bladder control, uh, bladder function. And in this study, we're trying to define just a mechanism for how we function and then how we will then uh, use our urology friends to help us uh, help people have better urologic function <coughs> excuse me, uh, over time. So this is just a quality improvement project. We look at how we're doing, we then study uh, that, we get the data, we make a change, and then we see what an impact that change has on patients' performance. I just wanted to give a couple of examples of studies that some of you may be aware of. Um, we have a, a several different comparison trials. These are medicines that uh, would be uh, one drug would be compared to another drug. As I mentioned, uh, we now have uh, nine FDA approved, as Dr. Vollmer noted, about to be 10 FDA approved medic medications, we hope, by the end of the year. And we're not really doing, uh, for relapsing patients in any event, very many uh, placebo controlled trials. So many of these trials are comparing one medication, maybe perhaps a new medication, to an older, uh, more traditional medication that's been available for some time. And there, here are some examples of those. Um, ONO 4641 is a medication similar to Fingolimod or Gelenia. It's an oral medication in the same family, and it's being compared to interferon beta 1A. Fingolimod, a couple of different studies, uh, a standard dose, 0.5 milligrams, versus a lower dose, 0.25 milligrams, compared to glutamine acetate or Copaxone. And then a different trial comparing Fingolimod at the standard dose, 0.5 milligrams, versus interferon beta 1A in pediatric patients. This is the first large-scale clinical trial with pediatric patients. There's no FDA-approved medication for pediatric patients. They're, by definition, patients diagnosed under the age of 18. And this will be the first one. So if effective, uh, we'll actually have an FDA-approved medication, hopefully at some point, for uh, the pediatric indication. In addition, we have monitoring trials. The one that most of you would uh, be aware of in the room, because we've tested, I think, everybody in the city of Denver, is uh, the JC virus antibody determination. Um, this is Stratify 1 and Stratify 2. These are long running uh, monitoring trials. And uh, thank you for your participation in, this, in these trials, because we now know a huge amount about the JC virus. This is the virus that's associated with this complication called PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, PML. And um, is seen in uh, patients who take Tysabri and, and actually a whole host of other medications and also have cancer or other conditions, HIV, for example. Um, but understanding the nature of, of, uh, of the biology of this virus has been incredibly important in trying to reduce that risk 
that's associated with the use of Tysabri in this case. And uh, we would not have been able to do that without uh, participation of, of many of you in the room here, as well as thousands throughout the world. In addition, uh, Dr. Vollmer talked a great deal about a brain atrophy, and for a good reason. It's incredibly important. Perhaps the single marker on an MRI scan that is most predictive of how you're going to do in the long run is brain atrophy. And uh, we have two different studies, uh, one with fingolimod, one with nalizumab or tisabri, looking at a systematic, <clears throat> looking at brain atrophy over time to see how actually these medications uh, actually uh, function over the long term. In addition, I mentioned the quality improvement project with the bladder. Uh, in terms of different types of studies that are phase one through the phase fours, uh, Dr. Vollmer referred to one of these medications, this uh, recombinant human IgM-22, and it's an IV infusion compared to a placebo. Uh, this is a very short term, and that's the reason why we can use a placebo. It's a phase one primarily safety study. This is a molecule that may well have remyelination capacity, and we're very excited about the possibility of, uh, of this medication in the long run. We have a phase two study. This is actually our own study. Uh, this is comparing rituximab, uh, again, compared to placebo for two weeks. Uh, you can do a placebo-controlled study when it's for two weeks. And then after that, everybody gets uh, uh, luteomer acetate or copaxone. The concept being whether or not we can recondition uh, the immune system so that it uh, uh, will have a different relationship with the so-called B lymphocytes because of the effect of the rituximab, and can the glutamine acetate maintain that over time, sort of after an induction by the rituximab. We have numerous phase three trials, as I mentioned. I, I just note a couple here with uh, ocrelizumab. This is a novel molecule that will actually, in theory, replace, if you will, rituximab. It's owned by the same company, uh, Roche Genentech, and it has a very specific effect on B lymphocytes, a certain subclass of white blood cells. And there are studies being done compared to interferon beta 1A in relapsing remitting MS, and then also against placebo in primary progressive MS. We use placebos in patients in studies with progressive MS because none of these medications are approved in this context, uh, and uh, we have to have something to compare them to, so we compare against placebo. And then the phase four studies, I mentioned uh, some of them as well, the observational study of natalizumab in early relapsing MS, that is patients who are treated very early as a first-line agent. Uh, in JC virus negative uh, patients is one of the examples of a phase four study that we're doing. So that's just an overview of the nature of the studies that we're doing right now. As I mentioned, there's 16 of them that are openly enrolling. For those of you who are participating, we really appreciate it. We're not going to ever get anywhere without your participation, and it's extremely important. In addition, just on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, we're also trying to figure out ways that we can learn from every single patient that we meet. Uh, you could say, yes, you can enter a formal trial, but more importantly, we want to know just how you're doing in a broader sense as well. And so a lot of that then will have to do with how do we look at outcomes in the clinic itself. And a big part of that is patient-reported outcomes or pros. And uh, patient-reported outcomes are important. Why? Well, we can't necessarily get everything in a 30-minute visit with you. It's extremely challenging, and sometimes if you can fill out some questionnaires and other things that give us information that we can collate down, we can get a good idea of what's going on with you in the real world. In addition, uh, we're interested in your perspective. We can measure MRI scans, and we can measure e this EDSS that we've talked about, this extended disability status scale. They're important. But it's also important how what your perception is, and your perception is not necessarily the exact same as what we see on an examination. Uh, my friend Elliot Froman in Dallas uh, frequently says that you know we have those examinations, but then we have the patient examination. It's the patient examination that tells us what the real world is actually about, and then and then it really also gets at this concept of learning something from every single patient that comes into the office, so that we can improve how we perform, we can improve then how you function over time. How are we going to collect this data? Uh, the concept is to collect standardized outcomes, a variety of different, uh, different uh, uh, patient reported outcomes. We're planning on uh, primarily doing this uh, with tablets. Uh, we have a plan in place to purchase uh, tablets, iPads, uh, and to use a variety of different uh, applications and web-based technologies, uh, perhaps using emailable links, but doing some of this in the office, perhaps some of it outside of the office before we even get to the office. And then, uh, and then from who will we ask this information? Pretty much everybody. Uh, mo mostly focusing on the patients, sometimes focusing on caregivers, sometimes focusing on spouses. Uh, but we're very interested 
in getting the perspective of the patient and then utilizing that information to help define how we're doing it. Dr. Uh, Vollmer mentioned us with uh, natalizumab, all those different patient reported outcomes, fatigue, quality of life, employability, all those other things, those are often patient reported outcomes. And, and with that particular medication, with natalizumab, multiple studies have shown that patients actually perform better using that medication. That's not something we've talked about a lot actually getting better. We've talked about maybe not getting as worse, but it's nice to be able to talk about perhaps getting better, and this is one of the ways we'll be able to collect that kind of information. So what are the, some of the types of outcomes that we're going to be interested in that we're going to try and incorporate into our daily uh, activities with the patients? They're all listed here, and you can read them as well as I can. The point is that there are many different parts of everybody's life that have to do with how they function in the real world, everything from bowel and bladder function uh, to uh, mood and sleep and other things. And we're interested in all these things because all of these things play a major role. And going back to uh, Dr. Alvarez's talk, talking about all the ways that the, all these things interact with one another, that's absolutely the case. I think that uh, fatigue is the best example of that. You could have an entire discussion for 45 minutes to an hour with a patient just talking about fatigue and all the different things that play a role in that. And a lot of them are reflected then through all of these uh, different uh, uh, patient report outcomes here. They all interact together. So with regard to clinical outcomes, uh, as uh, Dr. Vollmer noted, one of the standard operating procedures that we had uh, up there just uh, for using natalizumab uh, in patients uh, who are uh, being treated, we're trying to develop standard operating procedures for all the medications that we use and in all different contexts that we use them. For example, uh, the relationship of other comorbidities, diabetes, prior history of uveitis, heart disease, or other things, and how that affects medications that we may use, how that affects uh, different symptomatic therapies we may use, how that affects uh, the use of uh, ancillary services such as physical therapy. All of those things are extremely important, and we're we're, we've actually already developed the majority of the standard operating procedures, the goal of which will be to try and come up with uniformity in the way we approach the patients and then look at that and see how patients do. And if we find that when we look at it, they're, they're not doing as well as we think they should be doing, then to alter that. And we're trying to develop more uniformity in the way we deal with patients so that we can learn from them and then make adjustments as appropriate. So answering questions like, if you're on a certain treatment path reporting diminished quality of life or enhanced quality of life, what does that mean? How, does, how do we get to that? What should we change to try and get better enhancement with that? How do you improve the patient experience overall? That's the goal with trying to define a uniform approach, standard operating procedures, and then asking you, and then also using MRI scans and other things, the examination, using all of that data to try and come up with an enhanced patient, uh, patient experience. So the long-term plans are to study these patient report outcomes to identify trends for patients. And these will be, you know, dependent upon their stage of life, how their MS is doing, what medications they're using, and improve the patient care uh, through providing pro additional services, programs, and other things that identify those areas that are important, things that perhaps we uh, don't treat as well as we, ca we could or we, we don't have the kinds of uh, armamentarium available. Look at the various things that we could do to try and improve those things and continue to do these through effectiveness studies. So uh, the last slide that Dr. Vollmer had up uh, was a variation of this, the clinic team that's available at Anschutz uh, at the University of Colorado Hospital, uh, and the physicians, the nurses, the physician assistants, program assistants, medical assistants, CTAs, clinic managers, uh, Bridget Blanning, a longtime uh, employee for the Rocky Mountain MS Center, who's now a liaison, who's actually in clinic with us uh, multiple times a week, who's uh, trying to improve the relationship and the connection between the Rocky Mountain MS Center and what we do at the University of Colorado Hospital. This is a very large team, and this is just what we think of as our core team. But in addition, we have a whole host of associated physicians and other programs that we think are essential to the care of the patient with multiple sclerosis and related conditions. Uh, very importantly, Dr. Bennett, who's our neuro-ophthalmologist for many years, Dr. Hans, our radiologist, and all the others who are listed here as well. Perhaps many of you also know Jeff Aber and Mark Monago, who are physical therapists who have been with us for quite a long time. So we view this as a very large group. Uh, as many of you know, all of you know, this is a multifaceted condition. We feel that we need to have all of these people available because there are a lot of different things that we need help with. 
We can deal with mood disorders a lot ourselves, but we need help with that sometimes. And we're uh, actually just had uh, discussions this week about try how to try to develop a better re uh, relationship with the psychiatric world in Denver and the surrounding area to try and help with that as well. And then in addition, we also have some very specialized clinics uh, back from pump and Botox for those patients with significant spasticity. And then also uh, Dr. Miravalle uh, has just developed a lumbar puncture clinic, which we use in part for clinical diagnosis and then also in part for uh, clinical research studies. So again, even we even had a small uh, uh, quality improvement with that using a different needle, a different needle system that would hopefully decrease the likelihood of the major side effect of lumbar puncture, which is a headache. But in addition, uh, other than at Anschutz, we also have uh, uh, capability outside of, uh, of the campus over at University of Colorado. And the three uh, largest are then the Metro Community B Provider Network right here in Aurora over on Potomac. Tom Stewart, who's uh, been a long time affiliation with the Rocky Mountain MS Center, PA, and a, and a lawyer who has great expertise in helping people with disability, has been uh, working with Dr. Mira Valle there for the last couple of years. Uh, primarily uh, treating relatively underserved patients with uh, minimal insurance or Medicaid and uh, providing uh, excellent services there. Uh, Dr. Alvarez has taken over for me at Denver Health. Uh, I went to Denver Health for about 12 years uh, and uh, he has one big advantage over me. He lived in Spain for several years and he speaks Spanish. Um, my Spanish is marginal. Uh, so uh, Enrique is going there now. and. Uh, uh, and actually, just as part of our training program, we're actually developing a, uh, actually uh, an enhanced uh, Spanish capacity for our residents in training as well, focusing on Denver Health as well as at university. Uh, and in, for many years, for about 10 years, I've also been going to the Denver uh, VA uh, Medical Center, uh, where there's actually a large number of services with a long time Rocky Mountain MS Center supported uh, physical therapy and rehabilitation uh, group there that has been in function for over 30 years now. And uh, I'm a, I've been on staff at the, the VA for over 10 years now. So we actually take care of a, quite a few patients, also not at Anschutz. Uh, and uh, uh, amongst all of these, I think we take care of something like 25 to 30 percent of all the people in the state of Colorado and Wyoming with uh, multiple sclerosis. In addition, though, as many of you know, we have a large clinical research team. Uh, the lead research assistant is Haley Steinert. We have two of our excellent uh, 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 folks in the back, Barbie Holiday and Ginger Licht in the back as well today. And if you're interested, they have some information about clinical research opportunities uh, today. But we have uh, all the folks noted here as well, and our program assistant, Marcia Sabo. It's a very large group. We're arguably one of the largest, if not the largest, clinical research uh, for MS uh, groups in the country. And uh, we're very proud of everything that these people do uh, to help us and uh, for you as well. And so just one example, for example, Brooke Alvarez, uh, she's the one working on the standard operating procedures. A lot of these, uh, these uh, pros are patient reported outcomes, and that's one little area that she's been able to focus on. And all, all of our research uh, associates uh, have different areas that they function with. So I'm going to finish up here, and I think I'll be on time. I just have a couple of slides about uh, talk around the world. And um, I didn't know exactly what this was going to mean, so I just sort of made it up as I went along. Um, one thing that I would just urge everybody to do with regard to trying to keep in touch with what's going on in the world is stay in, in contact with the patient or, uh, advocacy organizations, the Rocky Mountain MS Center, the National MS Society, MSAA. They all have things that they can offer that are quite helpful, and it's very useful to, uh, to look at the various uh, types of of, uh, of information modules that they put out there. there. We have several excellent ones in forms and others. And uh, uh, there's constantly changing information, and I think it's uh, definitely helpful for everybody to stay in contact with these uh, patient advocacy organizations. Uh, telemedicine is something that is definitely coming. This is absolutely on the radar screen for everybody in every um, facet of American medicine. It's definitely on the National Mass Society's radar screen. They feel that this is a way that we can actually get help for our rural uh, patients and our colleagues uh, trying to take care of them in the rural areas, patients that can't travel over the mountains in the middle of winter to come and see us. Is there a way we can deliver medicine more effectively to these patients? And I think the answer is potentially telemedicine. And that's one thing that I think we're going to try and work on over time. Another sort of big concept uh, picture is uh, trying to define a disease activity-free state. Uh, for many years, we've been talking about 
annualized relapse rates and uh, the number of patients who uh, get progressively worse over time. But with the more effective medications, we're now coming around to the concept of how can we define disease activity-free status and, uh, as Dr. Vollmer uh, directly uh, stated, improvements that occur over time. And uh, Dr. Vollmer and I will be going to a meeting in Las Vegas in another couple of weeks, which will be the second round of, uh, of uh, meetings uh, sponsored by the Cleveland Clinic, trying to focus on uh, this concept of a disease, disease activity state, uh, disease activity free state, sorry. And how can we do that? How do we uh, first define it, both clinically as well as radiographically? And then perhaps more importantly, how do we get to that? So we define what the goal is, and then how do we get at that goal? And this is, these are the first steps towards working towards that, because that's really what we want to try to define. And then I have a couple other slides about some of these other things here. Um, this is just an example. Of, uh, of using this concept of disease activity free status in the so called Combi RX trial, comparing Avonex to Copaxin to a combination of the two, and showing that uh, at the end of three years, uh, by this combination of, of uh, both uh, no relapse activity, no change in your disability status, and no so called combined unique active lesions on MRI scan, that with the combination of the two medications, roughly about 35 percent of these patients had disease activity free status. Uh, it's, I just bring this up as an example, but also to note that this really suggests that there's an ongoing unmet need. Even using these two medicines together, only 35 percent of people achieve this status after three years. We have a little bit more way to go with this. With regard to MS treatment, my broad view of things is that there's really five approaches. Patient behavioral changes, treating the acute attacks, treating ongoing symptomatic uh, therapies, using the disease-modifying therapies, and then rehabilitative approaches. And I just want to talk about a couple of things that are sort of uh, important in this, in terms of talk around the world. The higher vitamin D levels, this has been data that has been accumulating over the course of the last couple of years. In my view, it's overwhelming data at this point in time, that if you're in the upper quintiles, if you, that is, if you break uh, people into five groups, uh, people in the upper quintiles compared to those in the lower quintiles clearly, obviously do better. And this is perhaps the best study looking at this looking at a, at a five-year database from the so-called benefit trial that uh, was alluded to before by Dr. Alvarez, I believe, uh, showing that in patients who are treated very early, in this case with beta seron, uh, if you then look at the patients who were in the higher versus the lower quintiles, clinical relapses, new active lesions were clearly uh, less in those patients with the higher vitamin D levels. And if you actually break it down by those in the low versus the high, you can see that the so-called risk ratios were all lower, all less than one for new active lesions, change in terms of the, the number of bright dots, the T2 volumes, and change in disability over a, a five-year period of time. So this is perhaps the best data so far, but I think the data is overwhelming that vitamin D is absolutely uh, essential in this uh, context of treating patients. And then now there's emerging data about the use of salt. This is perhaps the first study with human beings with salt. Uh, a group looked at a two-year study, 70 patients, and looked at salt intake as measured by looking at uh, urinary salt levels and broke people down into low versus medium versus high salt intake. And compared to a low salt intake, the patients with high salt intake had almost a four times relapse rate and had about 3.4 times risk of developing a new MRI lesion, and over a two-year period of time had eight more lesions on their scans. Eight more lesions is a lot of more lesions to have, and a uh, number of studies show that that much level of activity will have a significant impact on disability over time. So although this is the first study, it's relatively small and hasn't been repeated, and all that needs to be done, uh, it, uh, to me this is enough information to say that a uh, simple thing like trying to limit your salt, have you in a low salt intake area, is probably worth doing at this point in time, although we really need more data. With regard to the disease modifying therapies, I'm not going to certainly go through all these. You can think of perhaps altering the immune system, which is what we presently do with all the disease modifying therapies we have. Um, and there are a bunch of different new studies looking at, for, as I mentioned, multiple new uh, uh, so called S1P uh, super agonists that are similar to Gelenia. Uh, Ocrelizumab, I mentioned, will be uh, one of these B cell therapies or B lymphocyte therapies, and many other novel molecules that are out there, as well as different ways of looking at the old molecules, looking at a long acting version of Avonex, looking at uh, Copaxone in three times a week versus seven times a week. But in addition to altering the immune system, especially for those patients 
who have some fixed disability. Enhancing repair is extremely important and or replacing damaged nerve cells is extremely important. And there are a number of studies that are looking at both at the basic science level and then a smaller number of ones with people at unblocking those things that are, are blocking remyelination uh, with a greater understanding of that molecular level, for example, Wendy Macklin at our institution. In addition, as Dr. Uh, Vollmer uh, showed, this concept of inducible pluripotent stem cells uh, is, is uh, certainly um, one that has uh, created a new segment of stem cells that might be actually programmable, if you will, stem cells that we would like to use that are your stem cells and have a bunch of different advantages compared to, say, someone else's stem cells or stem cells that are primarily from bone marrow. And this is just a little cartoon about what you might think about with stem cells. It, the perfect stem cell is a fertilized egg, right? It can become a complete human being. But in reality, what happens is these stem cells over time will, will differentiate in different places over time. They'll have further differentiation, further differentiation, and then ultimately become fully differentiated cells, including nerve cells and neurons, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, the three core uh, nerve-based cells that we think are very important uh, for the functioning nervous system. But uh, most of the stem cells that are under study right now, so if you just uh, went to the Cleveland Clinic and they're doing a study with so-called mesenchymal stem cells. We participated in a study with placental stem cells. Uh, there are other stem cells you can get that are adult stem cells. These are primarily uh, bone marrow related cells that people have been using. There it is. And uh, most, of the, most of those cells ultimately become, you know, the red blood cells, white blood cells, platelet cells involved in clotting. But then a smaller number have the ability, if manipulated appropriately, become a variety of other things, including neural cells. Um, ultimately, uh, the cells that are being presently studied in most of the human studies are, are really going to be um, still mostly manipulating the immune system as opposed to the cells that might become the neural cells that would be replacing damaged cells in the nervous system. Um, but we remain to be seen, actually, what the capacity of these types of cell, cells are for actually becoming neural cells. But these are the inducible pluripotent stem cells, and the concept is that you have a cell that's fully differentiated. So for example, a urine cell, or you could take a cell from the lining of the cheek, a so-called fibroblast, a skin biopsy, and then you then can differentiate these cells, make them go backwards, become essentially a stem cell, and then make them go out the other direction and become neural cells. And this is exactly what Dr. Vollmer described, in this case using the lining cells from the urogenital tract, from the kidney, and these cells can then be grown and can be manipulated and can become neural-based cells. And the issue is what cell along this line would we like to use? In, in studies with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, and with spinal cord trauma, they're primarily focusing on cells that are sort of right here. Uh, that can become multiple different types of neural cells. That might be the right kind of cell, that might not be the wrong kind of cell, but ultimately we need to define that cell and we need to ultimately define how to turn that cell on, turn that cell off, deliver it to the right location, and then we'll be able to talk about replacing cells in the nervous system. And then finally, I just want to finish with rehabilitative things. Um, we mentioned physical therapy and exercise, extremely important, overwhelming evidence, I agree, that these are very important, especially exercise. But also, when people have fixed disability, there's, uh, there's a lot of interesting things going on with funct functional electrical uh, stimulators, or FES. Uh, many of you may know about the Bioness L300. There's another, uh, another uh, uh, similar uh, technique using something called a walk aid. And these are, uh, these are uh, they send a low level electrical impulse to the so-called common perineal nerve, and that stimulates your foot to make your toe go up, so that when you're walking, you don't catch your toe obviously very important for a lot of our patients. And in real time, this little sensor that you wear on your foot uh, will sense where your foot is in space and the varying gait speed and changing terrain will actually then stimulate and you have a little, uh, and you have a little um, uh, cuff, then you have the, uh, well actually I don't, well here it's actually shown here on the new one, and you have this little uh, 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 computer here that can tell to turn on and turn off and to adjust it uh, based on what you're doing very helpful for foot drop. But in addition, there's now this version, the, L, uh, NES, the NES L300 Plus, if I can make this work. And you, as you can see, this lady now has one on, not just on her lower leg, but she's wearing one on her thigh as well. And the purpose of this is that this allows stimulation of the quadriceps, if you wear it in the front, 
to help with extension of your leg. Or you can turn it around, actually, and you can put it on so it stimulates your hamstrings and helps with flexion of your leg. And that will help a little bit more with the knee action compared to just the stuff with the foot action. So it's sort of working up your leg a little bit to help, because a lot of our patients don't just have foot drop, they have leg weakness as well with the hamstrings. And then importantly, some of them also have very proximal weakness as well. So in that respect, now there's something called rewalk. Some of you may have seen this. This is this exoskeleton from Argo Technologies in Haifa, Israel. 44 pounds, it's wearable, and as I show in the back here, it's got a battery pack essentially in the back that's enough for at least a day. And this is useful for the entire leg. And this is essentially a similar kind of product as, uh, as you see with the, um, with the walk aid and with the uh, Bionis L300, uh, but it actually goes all the way up the leg. And this would be for people who primarily have uh, spinal cord injuries affecting their, their lower limbs but have relatively intact upper limbs. So it's a wearable, motor-driven robotic device worn outside the clothing, which is important because by an issue in the walk aid you have to wear underneath your clothing with direct stimulation right onto the nerve, and allows users to walk by detecting shifts within their sense of balance and then moves the user's legs in a natural gait. So this thing actually moves the legs directly. And obviously being upright has a, a bunch of potential benefits associated with it. They're listed there. And this now comes in a uh, personal version. There's a, per a version that you could essentially go to a rehabilitation facility and they would have one, but there's now a personal version as well, and it's up in front of the FDA uh, and should hopefully be approved sometime soon. This is not the answer, but this is an aid. And so uh, this is another thing that I think people have been talking about for some time now, and this is something that uh, is actually achieved reality. This is actually approved in Europe, not yet approved in the United States. So that's the end of my talk. I appreciate everybody coming today. Uh, have a great day. Enjoy uh, your Thanksgiving holiday. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And Dr. Vollmer is also still in the back. Have an awesome day.